Okay, so let's go talk about genes and uh, gene regulation. All right, so here is a picture of basically strand of DNA. We know that DNA is uh, double stranded. We know that it's anti parallel. So, and we talked about this before, right? With replication, transcription, and translation. Um, you know, we've talked about the anatomy of DNA. So, a gene is either going to be on one strand or another. Okay, so if a gene is uh, here, that means it's not over here. But then th there could be a gene on this strand too. Okay, so the genes can be found on either strand. All right, and we're going to talk today about what is a gene and then how is it uh, how is it controlled. So I'm going to show you. Uh, this slide first because I'm, I'm going to show you a gene, but the gene I'm going to show you has been modified. Okay? And the reason why I'm telling you this is because we know that when you take a DNA and you transcribe it, you use complementary base pairing to make RNA, right? So here is your DNA molecule. It's double stranded. The gene is going to be on one of the strands that we're copying. Okay. So we copy that strand, uh, we copy the part that where the gene is, and we call that part, we call that transcription, right? Transcription is when we copy that segment in, of, a, of a gene and we convert it into uh, RNA, right? Now, if you recall, you had some questions about transcription and translation. One of the things that happens in transcription is once you get your RNA, it's actually processed, okay? And what ends up going on is you get something called splicing. Now, you tell me what splicing does. So here's your picture right now. So here's your RNA molecule, okay? Take a look at it. This is it right over here. What does splicing do? What does splicing do? What's the purpose of it? Why do we splice up DNA? Sorry, not DNA. I apologize. Why do we splice up RNA? So let's first start with what is it? What is splicing? What do you think happened there? What's been cut out? What's missing? What color is missing? Pink. Right? You can see the pink has been cut out. So splicing is when we cut out these sections called introns. Now, let me show you something. This is a, I want to go back to that, that gene I just showed you. So do you see where it says uh, IBS? Okay. You'll notice, so you see IBS over here. Okay. Here's IBS 7. Now, IBS stands for the intron, okay? And then we have these regions called exons. And you'll notice that they alternate. So if we go all the way to the beginning, you'll see that it starts, so here's my, here's an exon, right? Here's an intron. So this section over here, that's, this is all an intron, and it ends where the next exon begins. So here's an exon and the exon ends where the next intron is. So so here's my next intron and you can see the alternate intron, exon, intron, exon, intron, exon. Okay, and they keep alternating until the very end with your last exon. Okay? And that's what you're seeing uh, here. Okay? So here's your exon, here's your intron, exon, intron, exon. The introns get cut out. So you saw the introns weren't exactly very small. They're quite big. They get removed. Why? 
the point of removing the introns? So I'm going to ask you a question. How many genes do we have? How many genes? 20,000? Okay. How many proteins does your body make? Do you think it's more or less than that number? I don't, I don't know the exact number, but I know it's more than 100,000. It's more than that. Why? I mean, how, how do you make, because I, we talked about a gene becomes information to make a protein. So how do we get so many proteins from so few genes? And the idea, one of the reasons is this, splicing. So I'm going to give you an example. Let's call this one A, B, and C. Okay? So we have intron A, B, and C. So right now, we cut out the, sorry, exon A, B, and C. We cut out the introns, and we have a sequence called A, B, C. Right? And that sequence is information. And that information gives you a protein. But the thing about splicing is you don't have to put it in this order. You can cut up your uh, RNA, you can cut the introns out, and you could rearrange the exons to give you a different order. Maybe you get this combination. Or maybe you get this combination. The point is what splicing does is by cutting out the introns, you can rearrange the exons and you can get different combinations. Now remember, what's translation? Translation is when you go from what? RNA2 to protein. So what are we rearranging here by splicing? What are we re rearranging? What is this pink or reddish molecule? What is it? It's RNA. So by rearranging it, what are you doing? What do you think you're doing it by rearranging it? What's going on? Kick back to protein structure. What's the first level? It's the amino acid sequence, right? And you saw the amino acid sequence comes from what? The codons, the three-letter codes from the RNA. So what happens if I rearrange the RNA? Do I get the same protein? I don't. So the whole point of splicing is that we can produce all of these different types of proteins by using less information. Okay? That's the value of splicing. It gives you a lot of versatility in being able to produce uh, different types of cells, oh, sorry, different types of proteins um, by using the exact same DNA, but just when you transcribe it and you rearrange it, you're reading it differently. So let me give you an analogy, okay? I, and I saw this is not my own analogy, but I like it. So the analogy works quite well. You got to think of it as splicing as the way a cell interprets information, okay? The whole idea is if you splice something, you saw you could rearrange it. So you're taking information, your original DNA molecule, you transcribe it, you splice it, you rearrange it, you get different information from the exact same DNA sequence, right? And that would be the equivalent of a cell reading DNA, but interpreting it differently. So maybe cell A reads a gene and gets protein X. It may be cell B reads the exact same gene, but cuts it differently and gets you protein Y. So you don't need two genes to get X and Y. You need the same gene, you just read it differently. So I'll show you an analogy, okay? Uh, now it's not mine, but it's a good one. So how, imagine that this, you saw this one, didn't you? So imagine this is information. This is the DNA sequence, okay? All right? And 
one cell reads this DNA sequence. So splicing is the following. This is an analogy for splicing, okay? Exact same information, but the way you cut it up, the way you rearrange it, the way you interpret it, gets you different proteins. So, Jerusha, how would you read that? I mean, no. Right, so you, one way you could read it is a woman without her man is nothing, right? Another way, maybe that's the way one cell reads it. But maybe another cell reads it differently. Maybe another cell reads it like this. A woman without her man is nothing. Totally different meaning now, right? Totally different meaning. A woman without her man is nothing versus a woman without her man is nothing. Now, I did not rearrange the letters. Okay, I did not rearrange the letters. It's just an analogy to help you understand that from the same information, you could get different meanings. Okay, that's what splicing does. I'm not sure if I put that. Check the boxes. Um, so that's what splicing does. Now, the other reason why I'm, I'm going into this is because it is something that you should know in terms of... Uh, what happens in transcription. But the other reason I'm going into this is because the gene that I'm going to show you, I, the introns have been removed. Okay? The reason why the introns have been removed is just so it's easier to look at because otherwise the gene will be really, really big. So what we're going to look at is just the, the axons. The axons are the coding regions. Okay? So I'm going to get rid of the introns. I'm just going to show you the exons. So instead of looking at, um, for example, all of this information, which is a lot, we're going to take out the introns, and we're just going to look out. We're just going to look at the exons and make it more manageable to look at. Okay. So the sequence that you're going to see has been reverse transcribed. Now you know what transcription is, right? It's DNA to what? RNA. What do you think reverse transcription is? It's RNA to DNA. So, you take your RNA that's been spliced. Audrey, what's splicing again? What do you cut out in splicing? Cut out the introns, the code, the parts that don't code, okay? And you're left with the exons. In reverse transcription, you take an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. Got a, a pretty logical name. Now, do you know of anything, if I've ever heard of an organism, or I don't know if you want to classify it as an organism, because it's not really living. You ever heard of anything that does this? Actually does this, naturally. You've heard of it, I guarantee you've heard of it. It's a virus, it causes AIDS. HIV, okay? HIV is a type of virus called a retrovirus. Its genome is an RNA genome. So if it wants to get its genome into your genome, it has to do this. Because what's your genome? What's it made out of? Is it RNA or DNA? Your, yeah, it's DNA, right? Its genome is RNA. If it wants to take its genome and put it into your genome, it has to do this. Because otherwise, it's not compatible. Okay, so reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that HIV uses to change its RNA genome to DNA. Here, it's being used to take RNA and make uh, make it into a copy, uh, basically to make DNA from it. So the DNA is the strand in blue. Now, what we can do then is we can then take this, which is a hybrid, because I can see this is part RNA and part DNA, I can get rid of the RNA, remove it, and then I have a single strand of DNA. And you know that you can take a single strand of DNA and use complementary base pairing to make it into a double strand, right? And what you're seeing, what I'm going to show you is a gene from, so it's a gene called oxytocin, okay? This is a gene involved in uh, during labor. 
when a woman undergoes contractions. This is the gene that produces a hormone that causes those contractions, okay? It's been reverse transcribed so that it's small. It's already a small gene to begin with. It's probably one of the smallest ones in your body, but it's even smaller because we've removed the introns. Um, before I proceed, by the way, I want to mention something about introns and exons. The, like, if you look at, um, there are two types of living cells, right, on this plant. There's prokaryotes and then there's everything else, right? What are prokaryotes? Bacteria. Eukaryotes are pretty much everything else, okay? So, the general rule of thumb is bacteria do not have introns, okay? eukaryotes do. So that's important because, um, and by the way, the reason why they don't have introns, I mean, I don't really know. The Probably the guess is because you saw that the introns take up a lot of space and maybe during the evolution of bacteria, they, for them, it was an advantage to have a smaller genome. Maybe having a smaller genome, having no introns is better for them. But for eukaryotes, having the introns and being able to cut up the, the RNA and rearrange it, maybe for eukaryotes, it's better to have a bigger genome so we can have more flexibility. Okay, But there is a difference between the two. So bacteria don't have introns and eukaryotes do. This is interesting because if you want to take... Uh, bacteria and you want to put a human gene into it, you have to take out the introns first. You can't just take a human gene, cut it out and put it into bacteria. It won't work because we have introns and bacteria don't know how to read the introns. So how do you take a human gene and put it into bacteria? You do this. You transcribe it. You cut out the introns. Then you reverse transcribe it. Then you take your DNA you, and make it in double strand, and then you plug it in. And if you do it that way, what's this DNA missing? What doesn't it have anymore? It doesn't have the introns. And then the bacteria can read it. Can you think of a gene that we do this with? It's a gene that we get bacteria to make this product, very important product. If you have this type of disease. They used to get it from killing, but they had to kill the animal to get it. Yeah, very good. Insulin. Okay. So now you get uh, bacteria to make, uh, to make insulin. And the idea is very simple. Um, all living things pretty much use the exact same code when they're deciphering RNA. Remember that the RNA we saw with translation, it's read three letters at a time. Virtually all living things use the exact same code to decipher, which means theoretically that if you take a, a, a stretch of RNA uh, and a human cell reads it, you should get the exact same amino acid list if a bacterial cell read it. And that's what you find. Okay, so if you plug in this uh, gene, human gene, into bacteria, you get the exact same amino acid list out. Okay, same amino acid list out will, will, uh, will come out because they read the same way. Okay, so this gene here has been reverse transcribed. So it's missing the introns. Still, so it's, it's small, but it's still quite, quite big to look at. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to look at what a gene is. So here is your DNA strand. So this is the part that was transcribed. Okay. So one of these two strands would have had the gene. It was transcribed into RNA. Okay. And then part of the RNA gets translated. So right away you see... Not all of the DNA gets transcribed, and not all, and not all of the transcribed unit becomes translated. Okay? We can see that there's part in front, 
in this part behind that does not get translated, okay? We can see that the part in front is called a leader sequence, right over here, okay? We can see it's called a leader sequence. We can see there's something called a start codon. We can see there's something called a stop codon. And I'm going to show you how you can find these things. Okay, I'm going to show you how you can find these things. We already talked about the promoter region. Do you remember what that is? What's the promoter region? What's the enzyme that looks for that region? What's it called? <laughs> What's the enzyme that looks for the promoter region? It's called RNA. Yeah, RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase is the enzyme that does transcription, right? That's the enzyme that takes the DNA and converts it into RNA. So what it does is it looks for the promoter region and then it starts to copy. After the promoter region, it copies this entire section that's being transcribed. So let's take a look at this. So I'm going to show you the anatomy of a gene. All right. This gene is going to give you a hormone. The hormone is found between the letters, the 94th letter to the 120th letter for this gene. Not this, every gene is going to be different, okay? Every gene will be different, but the anatomy will be the same. Like, you know, everyone here is different, but the order of your parts is the same. Your head, your shoulders, your waist, your knees, your feet. But Jerusha is different in Charlu, okay? So every gene is going to be a little bit different. But the anatomy will be the same. And that's what we're going to look at. The anatomy of a gene. Okay? So, here it's highlighted. Can you see that? Okay. So, see this part here in green? It's yellow? Mm -hmm. That ain't yellow. That's, that's not like a lime green or something like that. Okay. This part here corresponds to the uh, leader sequence, which is here. So you'll notice that the first part of your RNA does not get translated. If you remember the animation and translation, if you go back to watch it, you'll notice that when the R ribosome uh, starts to read the RNA, starts to make it into, convert it into uh, an amino acid list, you'll notice that this part of the RNA that does not get translated. And you'll also notice that it starts with a particular letter. Or, sorry, particular code. Do you remember what the code was? What was the start code for translation? Do you remember what it was? So I've actually highlighted it for you guys. No, I didn't highlight it. Why? Okay, so you see here, here's your line green, and then you see the section in red here. It starts with the letters A, T, G. Okay? Now, here's the thing. This is your genetic code. This is what cells use to translate their RNA sequence. Okay? So the ribosomes will... Basically, decipher the RNA using this table. Now, they actually don't have a table in front of them, but this is the way it works, okay? So if they read the letter AUG, that's a start codon, and it corresponds to this amino acid called methionine. So it's AUG. But you're like, you're probably thinking, that's not, that's not a U, that's a T. You got to mention something. What you're looking at here is something called the coding strand. Now, the coding strand is the opposite of the template strand. So, here is your DNA sequence. Okay? It's double stranded. So, you'll notice that one of the strands is purple and the other one is red. You'll notice that the purple and red are, what's the connection between the purple and red? What do you notice? They're complementary to each other, right? So you'll see that this is TGC and this is ACG. Transcription, we only copy 
one of the two strands, where the gene is, right? So here is the RNA. So I'm going to ask you a question. What was this copied from? The red or purple? You think it was copied from the red? How do you copy the RNA? Using also complementary base pairing, right? So is the white complementary to the red or is it white complementary to the purple? It's to the red. And they said blue. Did you say red? Oh my god, I'm hearing things now. Okay. You're right. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't, I, I thought you said purple. Okay, so, um, the white is complementary to the red. That means during transcription, this is the strand that was copied. Okay? Now, because the white is complementary to the red, and because the red is complementary to the purple, you'll notice that the white is exactly the same as the purple. So, the red... Excuse the interruption, and then you got on Okay, sorry. Uh, so, you'll notice that the template strand is complementary to the RNA. So this is the template, this is the template strand right here. But the coding strand is exactly the same as the RNA, except for, what's the one little difference? Right. Wherever there's a T, we replace it with a U. Okay? And this here is translated. So every three letters gives you an amino acid. So what I'm showing you is the coding strand, okay? So this here, this is the coding strand. This is not the strand that gets transcribed. This is the strand that actually looks exactly the same as the RNA, okay? So if this was RNA, what would it be? It wouldn't be ATG, it would be A... UG, and what do you notice about AUG? AUG is very special. AUG st means what? Start what? Translation. Okay? Start translation. So, anything before ATG. So what you do, if you want to know where we start translating, if you want to know where this begins over here, It's pretty easy. You look at your coding strand and you scan it and you keep reading until you come across the first what? ATG. Because ATG would be then AUG and we know AUG is start. So anything before that is the leader sequence and it does not get trans translated. Transcribed, yes. Translated, no. Okay? So far, so good. Now, it says here the, the, uh, the mature hormone is position 94 to 120. Now, how many letters is that? 94 to 120. It's actually 27 letters. And we saw that in translation, every three letters is one amino acid. So 27 letters gives you nine amino acids. And that is this section in purple. So this section in purple, from TGC all the way to GGA, that's the hormone. Okay? That's the hormone. So then what's the section, because translation starts here, and the hormone, the actual hormone is here, so then what's this stuff? What is that? Okay. What's this stuff here? So from here to here, what is it? Because if, if we start translation at this point, so if translation begins here, hold on. If translation, sorry. 
Why is this coming up now? Stay with me. Okay, so if translation begins here, but your hormone begins here, what's all this stuff in red here? What is all of this? Okay. So, here's a big fancy term. Pre-pro-protein. Recognize that, sir? You had a question uh, a while ago about pre, pro, insulin. Do you remember that question? You had a question a long time ago about pre, pro, insulin. We've heard of insulin, but what is pre, pro, insulin? What is that? Okay, so pre means one thing, and the pro refers to something else. So I'm going to explain what the pre is. The pre is this part. See this part that's been highlighted? From here to here, so this section to that section, that's called the pre part. Now, the pre is also known as the signal sequence. I like to think of it as the address label. Okay? So when a cell makes a protein, it has to know where that protein is going to go. So if you want to visualize it, the way I visualize it is, imagine the protein is the letter. We have the envelope. The letter is in the envelope. And then we have the address label. Okay. The address label is this first section that gets translated. Okay, it gets translated. Uh, but then once the protein arrives at the destination that it's, it's going to go, it gets cut out. So if you have a pre-pro protein and you cut out the pre, you're left with uh, what's called a pro protein. The pro protein is all of this. So from here, to here, that's my pro protein. It's basically the pre pro protein minus the pre. That's what it is. So here's the anatomy so far, okay? What's the first section called? What's this lime green section called? It's called the signal sequence. Sorry, not the signal sequence. It's called the leader sequence. Okay, so the first part is called the leader sequence. Charlie, does it get translated? No, because translation starts here. The first part that gets translated is the pre part or the signal sequence. Now, where does it end? You will never know where it ends. The only the only way you'll know where it ends is if you know where the protein begins because the signal sequence ends where the actual hormone begins. So it's actually sandwiched in between the start codon and where the mature hormone begins. So the start codon is over here. The mature hormone is over here. So this pre-section is in between. Okay? Now, where does the hormone end? So here, we're told that it ends around 411. So you can see it. Here's where it ends. Now, what's special about TGA? Well, look at the code. What would it be if it was RNA again? It wouldn't be TGA, it would be what? It would be UGA. What do you know about what's special about UGA? Stop. So UGA stop. So you can see that it ends here. So what do we call all of this? 
So from here all the way to all of this section here. What is all of this? We've cut out the pre, we've cut out the signal sequence. That's my pro protein. Okay? Now, if I cut out this stuff, and I just I'm, I'm just left with the stuff in purple. So the stuff in purple is just my protein, but the stuff in purple plus the rest of the stuff in red is my pro protein. In here, I actually have two proteins. There is the hormone called oxytocin, and that's the stuff in purple. Uh, but I also have a transporter called neurophysin, and that's from here. So that's from this section over here all the way to this section. So all of this in red here, after the hormone, that's my transporter. That's the protein that actually allows the hormone to escape the cell. So what you're seeing actually in this gene are actually two proteins. We have the little hormone here, very tiny, and uh, we have the transporter. Okay, and there's my stop. So here's our anatomy. We have the leader first, followed by the signal sequence. The signal sequence ends where the mature protein begins. What's left over is the pro-protein. So all of this is the pro-protein. But the actual protein is this section in purple, which is the 94th letter to the 120th letter. You can see that it ends with the stop codon. So that's the anatomy. There's one little thing left. Do you guys remember from your, uh, I don't know if you guys looked at it. Um, when the RNA gets made, there's something else that happens to it. There's a tail that gets put onto it. You guys look at that? There's a there's an actual tail. Uh, I don't know if you can see it in the diagram. I don't think I have a diagram of it. When RNA gets made, there is actually we know that it gets spliced, but there's actually a tail that gets put on. It's a tail of A's. And it gets put on by an enzyme called poly A uh, polymerase. The purpose of the tail is to protect the RNA. That's the purpose of the tail. Now, the enzyme that puts the tail on, so here's the poly A polymerase, actually looks for a sequence. Okay? And the sequence that it looks for is right here. The sequence is A-A-T-A-A-A. -A -A -A. There it is. Now, sometimes you'll have more than one A-A-T-A-A-A's. You'll notice that you also see it right over here too. A-A-T-A-A-A. -A -A -A. So what this enzyme does is it scans the RNA and it looks for A-A-T-A-A-A. Uh, -A -T -A -A -A. And then it knows that right after that, it's going to build this tail. Okay? And the tail is there to protect the, uh, the RNA. Because remember, where, where does, um, transcription happen? In what part of the eukaryotic cell does it happen? What organelle is transcription occurring in? So it's in the N. So so then, nucleus. Yeah, transcription happens in the nucleus. But where does translation happen? Outside the nucleus. So this RNA has to travel from the nucleus to a hostile environment in the cytoplasm. And the purpose of the tail is to protect it. It's like a coating. So that's, that's what the enzyme looks for. It looks for uh, AATAAA. And then after that point, it, um, it builds that tail. So, ladies, that's the anatomy of a gene. Okay. Um, we talked about the genetic code. We talked about um, the coding strand, the template strand.
Okay, do you have any questions? I know that was a lot. No? Okay. So now I'm, I'm going to explain what you got to do now. So do you guys have... Okay, hold on. You guys have this? You have this sheet? Okay. So here you go. So this is some uh, sample questions. So sample sequences for you guys to look at. So we just looked at one. Okay. Here we have uh, three others. Now, there are, on the second page, they tell you where it's from. So, one sequence is rat oxytocin. So, same gene, but from a rat. Uh, another sequence is from a different gene called human basopressin. And the third one is from a different gene from a different organism called chicken basotocin. Okay? So there, there are three different sequences. Now, I want you to look at... So there's oxytocin. This is the hormone that would get translated. This is the hormone involved in contractions. This is basopressin. What do you notice? Very, very what? Very similar. Why do you think they're so similar? Because they actually originated from an original gene called basotocin. That gene copied itself, and then one of the copies became oxytocin, and the other copy became basopressin. So they're going to be very, very similar because they actually are connected through a common ancestry of a, you know, a gene called basotocin. Now, your job will be to look at uh, these sequences and find, so I'll give you a little bit of time tomorrow, okay? Find the leader sequence, the signal, the poly A signal site, the start and the stop codon. I've done the first one for you, okay? So I'll leave it up so you guys can copy it. I want you guys to do the next two, okay? And then we'll look at answering these questions together, okay? So don't worry, you don't have to do these on your own. We'll do them together. Um, what you're being given is the information about where the hormone resides. So here the hormone is from 101 and 127. Here's from 108 to 134. Here's from 94 to, to 120. The hormone is always 27 letters long, okay? You're also told where the protein ends. So 526, 542, and 408. So what should you find shortly thereafter? You should find, for example, if this protein ends at 526, so if you scan, I know it's kind of hard to see, uh, but these things are written in 10 letter blocks. So like this is 541. So that would be 531. So that would be 530, 529, 28, 27, 26. So there's 26. And what do you see here? Let me erase it so you can see it. What letter do you see? TGA. So where the protein ends, you should see a stop codon either right after it or very soon after it. Okay? So why don't you guys try the rest of the sequences? Um, I'll give you some time tomorrow, and then we'll talk more about this tomorrow. Okay? All right, ladies? That's it. There's a lot, actually. It's too long.